And again, you see that they are on parallel lines. There's no evidence uh, from the fossils of a pattern of common ancestors and intermediates uh, connecting them. And one might think that this would be presented as a great mystery uh, if we assume that these all evolved by a tiny step by tiny step process, then somewhere in between there, there should be a universe of transitional intermediates, as Darwin said there had to be. Uh, where is it? Well, let me show you what we get instead now by showing you a diagrammatic representation of the photograph that we saw first. This is the empirical evidence on the parallel lines. And now, the next slide, please is a diagrammatic representation of the actual exhibit. Uh, now, notice what has been done here, um, that the lines are filled in, uh, and the magnifying glasses indicate the presence of common ancestors. Uh, to the casual museum goer, and I've tested this many times, uh, they don't see the difference between the parallel lines, which represent the empirical evidence, and the connecting lines, which represent the theory uh, or the imagination of the theorist. Um, and the common ancestors look as if they're really there. But more than that has been done. If you will notice, we have here 450 million years ago um, in the, the vertebrates, and 440 here down below, lower down in the strata doesn't make any sense in terms of the empirical evidence to alter the time scale that way, but you can see why it's done. It's done so that it will fit into the theory. Now, I wouldn't object to this necessarily if it were all labeled that way. Uh, if the museum goer were warned what is fact and what is theory and what is speculation. Uh, but it is presented in such a way uh, that the theory uh, seems to be um, as much fact uh, uh, as, the, as the fossils. Now, um, even if uh, we were to have common ancestors there, we were to have them, uh, that would only do a tiny bit to help the Darwinian scenario uh, because the claim of Darwinian evolution is that evolution is a, an undirected chance process and so there should be an absolute universe of, uh, uh, of forms uh, down there which is entirely missing. And indeed, now the final slide, please. Um, if we look at the Cambrian record from the standpoint of Darwinian predictions and compare it uh, with the fossil evidence, we see that the actual evidence looks something like this. You get all of the group, basic groups arriving at the same time. Some of them go extinct. That's why the lines don't go all the way up. And then there is a certain amount of variation and change within the pre-existing boundaries. Now, that's a picture of evolution of a sort within certain boundaries. But look at what is predicted by the Darwinian picture. Um, uh, what is predicted is, in the words of Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote about this in his fine book, Wonderful Life, a cone of increasing diversity, where you start with one thing and it branches off and gets more and more diverse as you go along. Here you have the diversity present all at the beginning. and the variation within those limits. That's uh, the end of the slides. Um, now, my con contention in bringing this to you is not that there's no way in which Darwinists can accommodate their theory or make various hypothetical uh, scenarios or whatever to accommodate uh, this evidence and to bring it within their theory. Obviously, that would be a long and detailed argument. What I'm showing you is that people who are committed to the theory in advance lose sight of the difference between the theory and the facts. And hence, they present as indubitably true of uh, that which is, in fact, very dubitable. Uh, the claim, that is, that there was a step-by-step -step gradual process, micromutation by micromutation, accumulated through natural selection, that produced these amazingly diverse basic groups of the uh, a uh, Cambrian explosion from the single-celled predecessors that are all that are known to come before. And it's not just diversity that has to be explained, it's complexity. You have to explain how new genetic information uh, came into the uh, world in order to make complex plants and animals out of single-celled predecessors, and where's the evidence that this happened? Now, of course, if you are a metaphysical naturalist. If you start with the assumption that nature had to do its own creating, 
then something very much like neo-Darwinian evolution just has to be true as a matter of your basic assumptions. Uh, there can be an argument about the details. Uh, there can be different sub-rival theories. The relative role of chance and of natural selection can be at issue, as it is between the neutral theory of molecular evolution and the uh, selectionist uh, alternatives. But the basic picture just has to be true. You have to explain everything on the basis of a combination of chance events and some natural law that creates the designing force, uh, something like mutation and selection. And so you tend to be very uncritical. Now let me give you another example of how uncritical a convinced metaphysical naturalist can be uh, when making the case for the neo-Darwinian theory. This uh, next excerpt is from the autobiography of Francis Crick one of the most famous uh, molecular biologists in the world, of course, um, co-discoverer of DNA, a passionate atheistic materialist and neo-Darwinian, the two tend to go together. Now, um, uh, Crick uh, strongly recommends a book by Richard Dawkins uh, called The Blind Watchmaker. Uh, the, a book which presents the modern argument for the uh, Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection. And here's what Crick says. He says, if you doubt the power of natural selection, I urge you to save your soul, to save your soul, to read Dawkins' book. I think you will find it a revelation. Dawkins gives a nice argument to show how far the process of evolution can go in the time available to it. He points out that man, by selection, has produced an enormous variety of types of dog, such as Pekingese, Bulldogs, and so on, in the space of only a few thousand years. Here man is the important factor in the environment, and it is his peculiar tastes that have produced, by selective breeding, not by design, the freaks of nature we see preserved all around us as domestic dogs. Yet the time required to do this on an evolutionary scale of hundreds of millions of years is extraordinarily short. So we should not be surprised at the ever greater variety of creatures that natural selection has produced on this much larger time scale. Now that's typical Darwinian reasoning from Darwin himself up till now. The use of selective breeding as a, as a proof and the claim that if selective breeding hasn't produced the kind of macro changes, the kinds of new forms of life, new bio complex organs, uh, that are needed, that's only because there hasn't been enough time. Yet a child should be able to see that the example is quite beside the point. It's quite beside the point because artificial selection, selective breeding, is a purposeful process in which a human breeder pursues a distant goal with skill and persistence. Yet the crucial claim of Darwinian evolution is that unguided material processes, unintelligent, purposeless processes, can do the work of creation. Uh, so right away, you see that it's not the same thing, it's not an analogy, it's something totally different. Moreover, as is well known, even with all the power of human intelligence and purpose, breeders are able to produce change only within boundaries. Even those dogs, are all members of a single biological species, which are chemically interfertile. Uh, we don't get dogs getting bigger and bigger indefinitely, as big as elephants or whales, much less changing into elephants or whales. And the reason is not that there's not enough time. It's because the variability in the gene pool gives out. And yet, a scientist of Crick's caliber seems to have overlooked these points. Why? Well, when you are proving something that just has to be true anyway, almost any evidence will do. It's the same reason that evolutionary biologists trumpeted the minor results of the peppered moth observation around the world. Uh, as you know, uh, an experiment showed that when the trees were dark in the Midlands of England, dark moths in a population tended to survive more frequently than light-colored moths, and so the percentage of dark moths in the population went up for a while until the trees became lighter again and the population went back to normal. A variation in population frequencies within a population in which there were dark and light moths all along does not have anything to do with showing how you can produce moths and trees and birds and scientific observers in the first place. And yet this extremely modest evidence that natural selection could do something was so thrilling to the Darwinian world uh, that uh, it became one of the most famous scientific 
uh, observations of all time.